us, Lord. Whatever is normal for us, Lord, move us out of that, Lord, to another degree, Lord. Father, we pray, Lord, as James speaks the word, your word would not return void, Lord, but it would accomplish everything that you have it set to do, Lord. So, Father, we say, Lord, let our hearts right now be good soil to receive a good seed that's going to grow up into a good tree, Lord. So, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would rock us out of the place, what is normal for us, Lord, so we become unrecognizable. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord. We pray your grace upon this word now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. We love you, Jesus. Can we just say we love you, Jesus? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, guys, you can uh, take a seat a minute. I'm just going to invite up the speaker. He's got a cool new jumper on. Um, So, Mr. Aladdin, or Aladdin, as some people say. Um, James, uh, I always feel like I'm saying nice things about James. But James is honestly still one of my favorite preachers in the whole wide world. And I feel, honestly, I feel so, so blessed every week to be running alongside James. I'm excited for what's going to come out of his mouth, what God's going to do through him. And he looks like he's in, he gets into lion mode. And when, you, when he, James gets into lion mode, whatever you say, it goes over his head. So I'm going to pass this mic over to the lion man right now. And you can get it going, okay? Maybe you guys want to warm up a bit. You might get cramp while you're listening. If he starts praying too fast. Okay, go. Thank you, thank you, man. It's great to be with you all. Thank you, Ben. Um, this is the SHIFT conference. Everyone say SHIFT. Yeah. This is a training conference. It's equipping. So we're not here to put on a show. We're here to raise an army. Do you hear what I said? We're not here to put on a show. We're not here to impress you. We're preaching and teaching. We're here to see God equip you and raise you up as part of this end time army. And uh, he's wanting us to be warriors that, have, that are strong, strong in the spirit. In fact, before I get into the things I'm going to share, I want to welcome everyone that is here from wherever you've come from. I don't know where you've traveled from, but I know some of you have traveled from down south, traveled from up north, wherever. Oh, down south, yeah, we've got, let's welcome Rob Sharp. Rob and Count here, right here. Rob is over here. Also, I want to welcome uh, my good friend, Michael Wood, all the way from the U.S. with us today. He's moved to Manchester. He's going to be speaking tomorrow. And I'm excited to hear him speak. And if you haven't heard Micah speak before, he's going to be incredible. Trust me. Also, Matt is going to be sharing tomorrow as well. And um, uh, we're finishing tomorrow around 5. Uh, and so we're going to have our final session. It's going to be a bit of teaching, but also Q&A, a bit of interaction. And so as the sessions go on, make notes. If you've got questions, things burning in hell, make notes. We don't have all the answers, but I believe amongst us, there'll be some wisdom that the Lord releases to whatever questions you might have. Uh, this is Prayer Storm. How many of you, this is your first time at anything Prayer Storm? Oh, wow, wow. Put your hand up, put your hand up. Let's welcome them, let's welcome them. Okay. I've got one question for you, and it's this. Where have you been? Where on earth have you been? Well, I know she's been in Kazakhstan. Well, yeah, but, well, you know, minus you, minus you. Minus. Everyone else, where have you been? <laughs> we have been right here in Manchester, stirring up fasting and prayer for many years. And so we're going to carry on doing that because there is no other way. You know, the 21st century church is looking for shortcuts. We're looking for uh, anointed men and women of God that we can outsource our responsibility to. Are you, are you hearing me today? And we use the sovereignty of God as a cover up for our spiritual bankruptcy. And so we blame God. Oh, God hasn't done it because God doesn't want to. Whereas God is looking down at us and wanting to say, okay, you know, we're like, where are the, we're like, where's the God of Elijah? You know, because they're like, God, you moved in such a great way with Elijah. Where is the God of Elijah? And God is looking back at us shouting, where are the Elijahs of God? Those who would be like him. And so we as a ministry praise them. We're in the business of building capacity. Raising up an army. So, you know, when we came up here and we started praying, I could feel like a lot of work needed to be done. And we've made some progress where we are right now in terms of the temperature, what's the atmosphere. But I'm telling you, there's a lot more progress we need to make. And part of the reasons why sometimes we can come into an atmosphere 
and just sit under it and not challenge it, especially if it's not the right atmosphere, is the 21st century church, I say this, I've been saying this in the last year often, has become a nursery. The 21st century church, especially in the West, has become a nursery where babies are being fed and not a barracks where warriors are being bred. And so if warriors are being bred, then warriors know one thing, how to fight, how to shift, how to advance, how to confront. And in case you think that's just weird language, it's all through scripture. You're called to put on the armor of God. Why? Because you're going to fight. <laughs> Is anyone alive in this room? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. As we go into your word, we ask that you would awaken us, you would equip us, you would sharpen us in the spirit. That you cause us to shake off every kind of thing we've come under, we're not even aware we're under. Our eyes begin to open, our spirits begin to come alive in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, a fish in water doesn't know it's wet. Because it's been in that environment for so long, it's just the norm. When you sit under an environment for so long, sometimes you don't have, a, a, you're not aware of how it's affecting your thinking, it's affecting your worship, it's affecting your prayer. And sometimes God brings someone else into that environment to wake you up and shake you up. And I feel like I'm going to be doing that today, by God's grace. <laughs> to shake us up and wake us up to the calling that God has on all of us. And you saw the advert, you saw the flyer, you saw something, and, you, and that's why you're here today. You're not just here, well, I hope you're not just here because you want to just hear a nice preach. You're here because you want to be equipped. It's shift. It's a, it's, a, it's a conference to equip you in prayer and in intercession. And so if we're going to equip you, some hard things need to be said, some things to encourage you. You know, as we're worshiping, I just feel there's so many people in here just carrying discouragements discouragement, unanswered prayers, things just weighing you down. And so you're here because you want to be equipped, but God wants you to find your war mode where all those weights are broken off of you and you can truly see yourself as he sees you as a warrior. And we've been doing this for many years. I don't know, to, uh, this year is probably the 13th year of prayer storm. So we've been doing this for a long time. And I met someone this Sunday who was saying to me, how do you do it? Because, you know, I just try to engage in some kind of prayer initiative. And I just feel so much backlash. And I'm, my voice is gone. And this has happened. And this has happened. This has happened. And I'm struggling so much. You guys have been going strong all these years. How, do, how are you able to do it? And when I hear that, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't really answer them properly because, you know, we were really dealing with their situation at that moment. So I didn't want to go into my own situations <laughs> because I was thinking, I said, well, I don't really go on the platform telling everyone everything I'm going through. The fact that I'm up here calling for prayer and, you know, releasing declarations does not mean I'm going through nothing either. <laughs> but I am a warrior. And I have a system, by God's grace, that has been developed in me that it doesn't matter what the enemy is throwing at me. No retreat, no surrender. That's not to say I don't get discouraged. That's not to say arrows don't come and hit me. And like, okay, I need to wake myself up and shake myself up again and, and get some kind of bearings and, and keep going. I, f I found a system that keeps me going regardless of what the enemy throws at me. So there is no plan B. I am sentenced to a life of prayer never to recover again. I pray when I'm depressed. I pray when I'm happy. I pray when there's breakthrough. I pray when there's no breakthrough. I pray when life is good and when life is bad. I pray whatever the context is, I am conditioned to pray. There is no other way. So when someone says to me, well, how do you do it? You keep going. I, you know, I use this illustration. If you're traveling from Manchester to Glasgow, I don't know how many hours it takes, or Manchester to London, let's say Manchester to, someone said, well, six hours. Okay. What is a city between Manchester and Glasgow? Someone give me one city. Maybe in between. Somewhere, that, somewhere in the middle. Carlisle. Is that right, Rebecca? I'm not sure you're good at geography. <laughs> and I don't know either, so I'm just saying. What is a city between Manchester and Glasgow? Someone give me one. Newcastle. Newcastle. Okay. Is that, is that right? No? <laughs> uh, Rob, so, he was so confident as well. He was like, Newcastle. give me one. 
Becca is Karel. Kawa. Okay, whatever the city is. Carlisle. So, you're traveling from Manchester to Glasgow and say you have to go through Carlisle and you get there and you're out of petrol. Okay? Let's just go with the illustration of driving. <laughs> Someone said I should have gone on the train. We're, we're using the driving illustration. So, you're driving to Glasgow and you run out of petrol, but you run out of petrol and kind of like halfway in between, if that's halfway in between, okay? Now, the, a normal person wouldn't sit there and cry and say, oh Lord, why? Why have you done this to me? Why have I not got no petrol? And say you've got money to buy petrol. It doesn't make any sense to sit there and just wallow in self-pity because you ran out of petrol. What do you need to do? Get to the petrol station and put petrol in your car and carry on your journey. So, we're contending for breakthrough. We're pushing in for things we want God to do that he said he wants to do because you got to realize prayer is not just about your will. <laughs> the will of God trumps your prayer request. So, that's just something you need to settle right now. So it's the will of God, and you're like, okay, Lord, this is your will. Let's say you're contending for a family member to be saved. You know it's the will of God, and you've been doing it for three years, four years, five years. And on the, four, on the fifth year mark, you run out of petrol. Get discouraged. Get tired. Thinking, oh, Lord, I've been praying for so long. Well, the destination is salvation. But you haven't seen that destination, man. You've not got to that destination, and you run out of petrol. Do you know what you need to do? Go to people that have got the gasoline that you need. Go into spaces that can give you the courage that you feel like you've lost. Find things that would refill your faith. And you know what? When you get that fresh feel, you carry on the journey. Because as a warrior, you cannot afford to entertain a mindset such that, you know what? I'm just going to give up right now because I get it's not the will of God anymore for this to happen. If you've been praying for 10 years, 15 years, we don't give up. Yeah. No retreat, no surrender. That is the mindset of the end time warrior that the Lord is raising up. And in the United Kingdom, there is an atmosphere of unbelief. There's an atmosphere of cynicism. And if you're going to be an intercessor or prayer warrior, you need to be aware that there's an atmosphere that's already conditioned to resist your effectiveness. So if you're not aware of it, you come under its influence. Whatever you don't consciously stand against, you're subconsciously influenced by. So you have to be aware you are in a battle. You don't have to be preaching to be in a battle. You just have to say, in fact, the fact that you walked into this room, you've just stuck your head above everyone else. Because you're like, okay, devil, I want to learn to pray. Like, you really want to learn to pray? Okay. He's all, people say, oh, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. We quote that scripture all the time. I want to say to you, the devil also knows the plans he has for you. <laughs> and he's got some serious plans. The moment you say you want to get serious with God, he also starts to make plans to make sure your desire to get serious and effective is frustrated. And so the pathway of seeking God, the pilgrimage, the whole journey of becoming an intercessor, the pathway is littered with wounded warriors. The pathway is littered with worried warriors. The pathway is littered with discouraged warriors who have forgotten the assignment because they ran out of petrol and somehow they didn't know how to find a, a system to refill them and keep them going. One of the key things you need to know, and this is not the teaching tonight, but the foundation for intercession is intimacy with God. So how have we been going all these years? Because that's the reality of our life. I was uh, somewhere recently, I forgot where I was, and, uh, you know, lots of preaching, lots of teaching. Oh, yeah, I was in America. I came back, and so there's an older man I meet every, often, every so often. He's an older minister. He's a bit of a, a mentor, accountability well-respected man. And so he was just asking me the tough questions. How was your thought life? <laughs> How's your marriage? <laughs> you know, how was it when you traveled? Were you watching anything in the hotel room? Were you, how many know that's good? <laughs> if you don't have that, get it. Yeah. 
Because we've got to be in places where we have accountability. And so he was just asking some questions about ministry. And I said to him this. I said, for me, ministry is not what I do on the platform. Ministry is my life. So as, as soon as my life comes out of alignment with God, I don't have a ministry. Now, you may not know that. And I could end up on the platform and look good. Because there, there are lots of preachers that can preach good but have no walk with God. And the church is deceived, thinking because they heard a great message, that man is walking with God. Not really. You could preach a great message and go and sleep with someone in the hotel that's not your wife. And it still feel like the message was anointed. So, so you got to realize that we can deceive each other. But when we come to the whole context of uh, intercession, you can't really be an effective intercession, intercessor without intimacy with God. And if you're going to have intimacy with God, you're going to have to value that life with Him. That life with Him is disconnected from platforms. So I am more conscious of that inner connectedness of my heart with God, whether I have a microphone or not. So one of the ways we keep ourselves fueled up in intercession, and one of the ways we keep going, regardless of the arrows and the things the enemy throws at us, it's having a place where we have a consistent heart connection with God that's disconnected from platforms, assignments, uh, 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 needs. Because Christ, this is one of the problems. A lot of Christians, our prayer lives are crisis driven. So the crisis increases, we pray intensely. The crisis stops, then we stop praying, or the intensity of the prayer stops as well. But in these days, the Lord is truly wanting to raise up. A, a whole new breed of warrior intercessors that have that foundation of intimacy where ministry is their life. How you treat people, how you commune with God, whether you have a preaching engagement or not. I don't pray because I'm about to come and preach to you. Whether I never preach ever again in my whole life, I'm still going to be a man of prayer. Okay, so I don't pray to come and preach. I preach because I have a life of prayer. So everything I do is coming from that foundation of intimacy with God. In all honesty, that's what keeps me going when in any few moments I could look at something on this side that could take me down the trail of discouragement. I'm sure probably every minister has something in their life or everyone that's really walking God has something. Where you can look. Lord, there's a bit of mystery in this area. I don't really understand what's going on. And if I choose to keep traveling down that that thing of wanting to have everything explained to me, I'm going to end up in a place of depression. So I have to be able to live with the mystery of, Lord, I, I, I trust your nature. I don't understand that, but I trust your nature, and I'm going to keep digging deep in intimacy with you. That is how I stay filled in intercession and still being able to war with confidence because I don't allow offense to get in my heart towards God. And t I tell you what, it's so easy to get offended at God. The reason why I'm sharing these things is, like I said, during the worship, I could just feel weights on people, discouragement, feelings of unanswered prayer. Well, I prayed for this person and they died. I, I prayed in this way and this happened. I prayed like this and this and that. Listen, there's so many layers of things going on that we often don't have any idea about. So the starting point is intimacy with God, and you can't really have that without trust. So we step into trust. One other thing I'm going to say, then we're going to read a scripture, is because this is a training session, I want to state some things I often state, but it's good to make these bold declarations so that you understand how we think about prayer. Can I announce to you today that there is no such thing as a gift of prayer? Can I announce to you today that there is no such thing in scripture as even a gift of intercession? Now, I know that we can use those words to refer to people that carry something special. But as far as my perspective, looking through the Bible, reading Genesis to Revelations, looking through the life of prayer and people God has used in Scripture, I have not seen anything that he's referred to as a gift of intercession or a gift of prayer. What I have seen, though, is a spirit of grace and supplication. Okay, so... It's good to make this clear because oftentimes people like to 
put the, uh, the responsibility on someone else. And so they say, well, James, you're leading prayer storm and you like to pray. So I'm just going to inbox you my prayer request right now because you've got the gift of prayer. That's the problem. The moment you think I've got the gift, you think your job is to outsource your prayer life to me. And I just do all the praying for you. But we don't have a gift of prayer. We are called to do this ourselves. So this is a DIY ministry. Do it yourself. Everyone say DIY. DIY. It's a do-it-yourself ministry. That's why the disciples were asking Jesus not to do their praying for them, but to teach them how to do it themselves. Now, there is a grace you can experience, and there are people that carry unique anointings, even in prayer, for specific assignments. And oftentimes, I see that as a leadership thing. They might lead in that area, just like you have worship leaders. A worship leader would lead in worship, but they're not there to do your worship for you. When they sing and they do what they do, they inspire you to want to engage in worship. Well, that's the grace that they carry. You don't look at them and tell them to do, their, do your worship for you. In the same way, I've got grace to lead in prayer. But it's not to say I'm there to do everyone's prayer for them. Now, it's also good to balance that because the fact that you're passionate about prayer does not mean you're a prayer leader. Do you understand what I'm saying? The fact that you are a passionate person that likes to pray does not mean you're... Because I've been in prayer meetings and we're... we're, See, let's say there's 20 people in the prayer meeting and um, the prayer meeting is going good and there's someone in the room that likes to pray but they're not a prayer leader. It's not that it's wrong for them to pray but you can tell when someone carries an anointing in leadership because when they start to pray, it mobilizes the whole room and there is momentum behind it. And so there are times where some people start to pray and you can tell that it's, it's scattering the room. And as they're praying, people are more disconnected and disengaged. It's not that God is not listening to their prayer. It's just like someone trying to come up here to sing that can't sing in tune. And someone trying to come up here to lead that can't, you know, play an instrument, trying to play. How many realize that would be more distracting than helpful? In the same way, there are such kind of graces that God releases in prayer. However, we're all called to the ministry of prayer and intercession. Every single believer. Think about it. Jesus did it himself. The Holy Spirit did, does it. Jesus does it. Two-thirds of the Godhead do this. So this is a big deal in the heart of God for God himself to do it. And I often say, even if there's anyone that had an excuse not to pray, guess who it is? Jesus. He's praying for many hours. And sometimes we think we're okay with just a few minutes. When he himself is praying for six, seven hours, who are you to think two minutes is okay for you? I was doing a a session with some pastors and a leader was saying to me, you know, I just, I just, you know, I I don't see, they didn't really say this way, but this is really what they were saying. I I don't really see the need to do all these long prayers. You know, you know, I just tell God what I want and what I need and it takes me a couple of minutes and I'm done. Why does it need to be so many hours? In my mind, I'm saying, well, Why don't you say that to Jesus? He's praying for seven hours. And his disciples are so intrigued. They're asking him, teach us to do this. And when they learned how to do it, they're doing the same. Many hours. And they did it so well, they discipled the whole church in doing it. So Acts 12, the church are praying for many hours. Because when Peter was set free from prison, the church were praying. It was in the middle of the night. So the whole church had stamina. But we come to the Western church and we can see that there's lack of stamina. Because we say, let's pray and we can feel the weakness. The reason why the corporate uh, prayer times are weak, are often because the private prayer place is non-existent. The more there is private prayer going on, it feeds into the public place. And you can feel the strength of it. I often say some people come into a room and it's time to pray and they drain life out of the room. Some people come into a room and it's time to pray and they give life into the room. Which one are you? Are you a life drainer or a life giver? Because you're like, you know what? You know, I've been living in the UK since 2001. And so I do a lot of stuff in British churches, ministry in British churches and English churches. And it's all conservative. You know, we're just calm. We're just cool. You know, we're, it's like, James, your preach is so powerful. I was leaping on the inside. And I'm like, well, you should have updated your face about that. Because when I was preaching, your face looked bored and disconnected. 
But when you're watching your favorite movie, your face lights up. So why do you think you have to shut down in church? So there's, there's something in you that needs to come out of you. And it's not just me, just me. Oh, James, you're just a crazy, charismatic, Pentecostal, Nigerian, silly guy. Listen, God has called us all to give him everything that we are. So I'm going to be crazy. I'm going to do me. This is how I'm going to do me. And so you're called to do you too. So where I'm going with this is before I read this, and I'm going to read the scripture, I promise. We're going to Exodus 2, by the way. Exodus 2. I'm going to read the scripture in a moment. But I want to establish this foundation that the ministry of prayer and intercession is for all of us. And so we're going to grow in this. You don't learn to pray by reading a book on prayer. You don't learn to pray by listening to a sermon on prayer. You learn to pray by praying. The way you grow is doing. And if you don't do it, you just have your head full of it and you never advance. So having said that, let's look at Exodus 2. Exodus 2, 11 to 12. It says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, uh, beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren, verse 12. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he, he killed the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. So we know from reading other scriptures, for example, Acts 7, that when this happened in Moses' life, he was 40 years old. Everyone say 40 years old. And we also know that he was brought up uh, by the daughter of Pharaoh. So Moses is a full-grown adult at this point. And in essence, he has been discipled in the ways of Egypt. So Moses has the mind of an Egyptian, but the heart of a Hebrew. So he sees a Hebrew being oppressed, and something is activated in his calling. Now look at this. He says, now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, he went out to his brethren and looked, he looked at their burdens. See, this is so key, because as you start to grow in prayer, you realize that prayer is actually, when you step into a real prayer, real prayer often comes as burdens. God starts to weigh your heart with things that are on his heart. Effective prayer is receiving what is on God's heart and then praying it back to him. The prayer meetings I enjoy the most personally are the ones that come from the burden that God gives. Now, this is one of the reasons why it's not that I'm opposed to having prayer lists. And, you know, because, you know, we go to prayer meetings sometimes and there's a list. Oh, we're going to pray for uh, so-and-so. They broke their knee. We're going to pray for so-and-so. They broke their neck. We're going to pray for so-and-so. They broke their toe. We're going to pray for so-and-so. You know, they're not happy and they had a hard time last week. And we go through the list. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. However, I'm trying to say to you that there is something different about receiving God's burden as opposed to going through your list. Now, it's right for you to go through your list because that, that, there's provision in the, in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is like the ultimate template for prayer. Our Father, you know, context is relationship, intimacy. Who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, worship. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's intercession. See, that context right there is all about God's agenda. Look at the structure of the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Give. So the first part of the prayer is about who? It's about him. The second part is give us our daily bread. So th there's, there's a kind of petition nature to that. So it's not wrong to have petition prayers, but I think you would grow a lot more in prayer if you give space for God to give you his burdens. The prayer meetings I find sometimes um, draining. Some, for me personally, it might be different for you because I can't use my experience to determine how everyone else's experience is. The prayer meetings I find sometimes difficult and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and draining can be when there's so many lists of things to go for we pray and then we go for this and we go for it. and sometimes we're not even sensing the flow of the spirit on anything because we might have 10 things on our list and the spirit was only working on point one and point two but because we're so eager to move to point three oh yeah we said our prayers we said the words and so we're done we don't know how to discern burden 
And because we don't know how to discern burden, we're missing the flow of prayer. Because when burden comes on you, you can pray for an hour, two hours, because it's, it's a burden. Have you ever been in a meeting where someone comes in and they share a really bad news? Like so-and-so is on, you know, he's in hospital right now, and they have a really, really bad report. And, you know, unless God breaks in, there is no other way. And everyone in the room is so heartbroken And you know what happens? When someone comes there and says, let's pray, I guarantee you most of the room will be engaged. And they would pray with emotion and heart because they've received a burden. Burdens affect how you feel. Burden is not intellectual. Okay, we're going to pray for... Now, it's not wrong to start in the place of the intellect. Like it says, pray for those in government. We're going to pray, Lord, we bless, you know, the, those in government right now. We pray for wisdom. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying one of the effective way, one of the most effective ways I have found to grow in prayer is to seek for God's burdens. And I find that sometimes they can be quite unique to people. So there's some burdens that God's going to give me that he might not give you. He may give you a burden to pray for marriages. And when you pray, you're weeping, you're groaning. See, that's because your feeling is out. Hebrews talks about how Jesus prayed. He prayed with weeping. He prayed with groaning and strong tears. Jesus did not pray casual prayers. And you know the saying, a casual approach to prayer produces casualties. So you're built to pray with your heart. God wants us to pray with our whole being. Burdens are important in prayer. You have to receive God's burden for your region. You have to receive God's burden for your nation. You have to receive God's burden for your family. To really pray effectively, you need a burden from heaven. And that burden is going to affect how you feel about it. If the prayer is not moving you, why do you think heaven will be moved? So God wants to connect with your emotions. That's why Elijah is one of the amazing prototypes in terms of prayer. Because uh, uh, James 5 says he prayed earnestly. Earnest prayer is intense. Earnest prayer is consistent. See, he was engaging his heart. But oftentimes in the church, we've settled for intellectual theological prayers. That sound good, but moving nothing. You know, sometimes in prayer, a single cry and groan can move things in the spirit. More than a nice oratory. And someone in the room, oh gosh, they can pray so nice. Oh, I loved your prayer. It was so, well, don't tell me you love my prayer. The question, did anything move? (laughs) Did angels move? Did demons move? Because that is the real realm that we want to shift. I don't want to impress you. I want to shift the realm of the spirits. So if that's the case, then first the prayer actually starts in the heart. Look at what happens to Moses here. He went to look at his brethren, right? He saw an Egyptian, uh, actually back up. He says, and he went out to his brethren and he looked at their burdens. He didn't take on their burdens. He just observed it. This is interesting because this guy observing the burdens doesn't know God yet. This Moses is called to be a prophet. He's not just called to be a prophet. He's called to be an intercessor. He's called to be a deliverer. So something was going on. And you see, when you're called to be a prophet, there will be signs of that in your life where God starts to stir you. Even though scriptures doesn't say it, but if you read uh, 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 Acts 7, Stephen's account of Moses' life, You see, he thought in his heart that God would use him to bring deliverance. Why did he think that? He must have had some revelations along the way. He must have had some dreams. He must have had some encounters. Because you can't be a prophet of the magnitude of Moses and there will not be some little droplets from heaven when he was a teenager. Little droplets from heaven when he was in his 20s. To show him that he had something on his life. So he came and he said, there's a reason why Moses felt the way he did. Because he could have easily stayed with Pharaoh, stayed in the palace. But God was stirring his heart. Do you know why God was stirring his heart? And again, we, may, we don't have time to dig into all the scriptures. But Acts 7 and Exodus 2, you can read them side by side and you get some more details that you don't see in Exodus 2. We see that his heart was stirred 
Because the Lord was doing something to him. But not just that, a time was drawing very near. And so the children of Israel had been in captivity for hundreds of years. And so when you look at the prophetic words spoken to Abraham by the Lord himself, the word was this, your descendants will be in captivity for 400 years. Everyone say 400. So God is speaking these words. Okay, so these are not approximate. Because sometimes like, well, maybe God meant about 400. No, he actually meant 400. Just like we read about Jeremiah saying they would be in captivity for 70 years. If you read your Bible carefully, you see that Daniel read the prophecy of Jeremiah when it was about time to be fulfilled. So they were entering, if they had not entered into, they were entering into that 70th year whether we're meant to come out of captivity, Daniel sees that prophecy and he doesn't go and write a book about it. Amen. Daniel sees that prophecy and he doesn't, put, uh, he doesn't put together an Instagram reel where he's saying, and the Lord said to me, it's time for us to be delivered. Daniel didn't set up a conference for all the Hebrews in captivity and say, people, the Lord has spoken to me from his scriptures and it's time for us to be saved. Daniel didn't do that. You know what he did? He set himself to fasting and prayer. Because he knew the time was now. And so he starts to pray. And then you read the book of Ezra. It says, when it was about Ezra chapter 1. You see, when it was about time for the word of the Lord through the mount of Jeremiah to be fulfilled. This is the 70th year. God stirred up the spirit of the king. Why did God stir up the spirit of the king? Because Daniel was praying. The fact that it was 70th year didn't mean the prophecy was just going to happen. This is where many people miss it. The fact that something is the will of God does not mean it just happens. And this is where I get frustrated with the prophetic movement. And by the way, I am part of the prophetic movement. But it seems to me like in the prophetic movement, many people more want to receive prophecy than pray. Many people want more want to give prophecy than stir up intercession. So we have a lopsided church. Even though God is stirring up the prophetic, because according to Joel 2 28, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And one of the signs of it is your sons and your daughters will prophesy. So the prophetic movement is key in these last days. But I want to say this boldly. Run away from every prophetic movement that doesn't have intercession at its core. It is deception. In fact, let me say this. The true test of a prophet is their death in intercession. Where did I get that from? Jeremiah 27, 18. He says, but if they are prophets and if the word of the Lord is with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts. He says, if they are prophets and the word of the Lord is in them. So the litmus test for a prophet is that they have the core, the DNA of an intercessor. You see that in Moses. You see that in Daniel. You see that in Elijah. You see that in Ezekiel. Name the prophet. It's all there. Amen. So Moses is being stood up prophetically, but he's lacking the, intercess the intercessory legs. To fulfill what God has already been stirring in his heart. Are, are you tracking with me? This is so dangerous. Because we so love to receive prophetic words. And I love to receive prophetic words too. But listen, prophecy is an invitation to intercession. Prophecy is not there to make you feel good. Yes, you feel good in the moment. But it actually gives you ammunition for war it's uh, god is like giving you bullets when he gives you prophecies and those bullets needs to be put into your intercessory rifle and get ready to shoot some devil <laughs> don't just sit there and go oh, thank you lord for this word see that's the problem we're raising up people that come to to meetings and conferences and just want to receive and just want to receive but they don't know how to fight they don't know how to use what they've been given and so the people on the platform sometimes actually enable the dysfunction the more. 
because they want the people to come to them because they're the ones that have the anointing to do blah 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 and it's like we're all called to do this yes you may be called to lead in it you may be part of the fivefold ministry you may be a prophet you may be uh, you know an evangelist but it's not to say it's just you that's called to do this in fact you're called to equip the saints so that we all do this but the problem is when the prophet themselves are no intercessors what are they going to raise up a bunch of people that just want to prophesy a bunch of people that just want to receive words but don't want to work it out prophecy is powerful and it's significant but you can't really have the prophetic without the intercessory we're gonna end up eventually in deception in fact the intercessory arm of the prophetic helps us to be rooted and grounded we receive burdens, then we're able to pray them through. If we lose the intercessory, the prophetic is going to become platform-based ministries that are just there to impress. And people get stirred up with giftings. Oh, you're so anointed, you can give me a prophetic word. It's so accurate. The fact that prophetic word is accurate does not mean it's from the right spirit. And by the way, you can start out in the spirit and end up in the flesh. I hope you realize that. So you could start out right. But because you're not being anchored in the Holy Spirit, something else starts to influence Some, Are you with me? So you could be prophesying but from another spirit because you don't have the depth of intercession. There is no way you can be an intercessor and lose the heart of God. Because the whole idea of intercession is you capture his burdens. And when you capture his burdens, you feel for people. You see how he sees it's a danger. I'm going to labor this point. It's a dangerous thing to embrace pro the prophetic movement without the depth of intercession required. To see those words and what God is speaking released in the earth. It's a dangerous thing. We're going to raise up a bunch of Christians that are wimps. And sometimes I wonder whether even some of the things we call prophecy... Are people being more exercised in their spirit and being able to grow their spirit to be strong to discern things nothing wrong with that they've by reason of use they exercise their spirit and they can discern I put my hand on my and I can feel what it's feeling I put my hand on it, I can I can discern but the fact that I can feel that does not mean Holy Spirit is speaking so by my spirit being developed I can sense things but it's actually quite another realm of effectiveness to be able to decipher what the Spirit is truly saying. <laughs> Can I go somewhere again? The fact that someone says, thus says the Lord, does not mean that's what the Lord is saying. You could say, thus says the Lord, and it's you saying it. You could say, thus says the Lord, and it's the devil saying it. You could say, thus says the Lord, and it's the Lord saying it. So you who are receiving the prophecy need to discern where is this coming from. And by the way, a prophetic word can come and the first part could be in the spirit. The second part could be in the flesh. And the third part could be just something else. Now you have no idea what is what. You just receive everything, hook, line, and sinker. You don't learn how to test. Lord, what is really of you? I don't know why I'm going here, but this has been on my heart for a while. <laughs> We need to be balanced in a nice, in a, in a good way where we're not saying prophecy is wrong, but we have to discern where is it coming from. And if it's the Lord speaking, then that word of the Lord needs to be backed up with some prayer. Not just the word that makes us feel good. The moment we can, we can settle that this is the Lord, this is really the Lord, that prophecy is going to drive us, if we're truly receiving it right, is going to drive us to the place of intercession. That's why I have problems with people that just want to receive prophetic word, receive prophetic word, receive prophetic word. But it's like, they're not really, they, you, can, you, you can see that they're not really people of prayer. Why do you think Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.18, this charge I give you, Timothy, that, by, uh, that you wage the good warfare by the prophetic words that have been spoken over you. If I say the wrong way around. He says, by the prophetic words that have been spoken over you, you may wage the good warfare. He said to Timothy, we had some prophetic words that have been released over you. Use them to fight. Here we see Moses. Even though I'm reading deep into the story, I'm, I'm sure there were stirrings that the Lord was 
having in his heart that he may not have discerned. So he was able to go to the Hebrews, look on their burden, but not take it on. Because if he took on that burden, it would have transformed him. So we're going to do some maths now. The prophecy said they will be in captivity for 400 years. How many years were they in captivity for? Anyone else? 430 years. So they were meant to be in captivity for how many years? 400. But they actually ended up in captivity for 430 years. So when the Lord spoke to Abraham and said to him, your descendants will be in captivity for 400 years, was God just approximating? He was being specific because when he said 70 years in captivity, he meant 70. Why would he mean 70 and not mean 400? Are you tracking with me? So as we look at the nature of God and the way God works, in fact, God is so specific. When he was telling them to build the temple, he gave them specific instructions with measurements, not approximations. He could have said, oh yeah, do it about this and about, he was very specific because he knows exactly what he wants. So if he said 400, he meant 400. So now the question is, why were they in captivity for 430 years? When God said 400, now this verse we just read here, Moses, according to Acts 7, Moses was 40 years when this thing took place. So... We also know according to Acts 7, and also some parts of Exodus, actually the later chapters of Exodus, we know that Moses was 80. Everyone say 80. 80. So Moses was 80 years old when they came out of Egypt. Everyone say 80. 80. So can we do some maths here? So Moses was 80 when they came out. So according to Scripture, That 80th year was actually the 430th year of captivity. Are you with me? So 80 minus 40, obviously give us back to 40, which was when the Lord spoke to him in this verse. So now 430 minus 40 brings us to what? 390. So we've just read Exodus 2, 1, and sorry, Exodus chapter 2, uh, uh, verse 11 and 12. What we just read there, when Moses looked on their burden, that happened in the 390th year of their captivity. Are you tracking with me? So the Lord starts to stir Moses because there was 10 years to go. 400 was 10 years down the line. Moses is 40. He comes to see what's going on, but he doesn't know the voice of God. God was probably stirring up prophetically, but he hadn't developed his intercessory muscles yet. So what should have been accomplished by the Spirit, he tries to accomplish in the flesh. Because you see, when you're an intercessor, it doesn't mean you're not an activist. Because I, I, I'm an intercessor, and by the way, you're an intercessor too. Don't count yourself out. So people think, oh, because you're an intercessor, you just want to pray, pray, pray. Listen, I am an activist. I like to do I like to get things done. In fact, when I'm praying, oftentimes I have to make notes because as I'm praying, all the thoughts are coming through my mind of things I forgot to do. (laughs) So the first 30, 45 minutes, I'm just making notes. Okay, I'll do that later, I'll do that later. And then by the time that's out of my mind, then I'm ready to pray. Anyone knows what I'm talking about here? So the fact that you're called to be an intercessor does not disregard that sense of being an activist. But however, Moses was acting in the flesh without first doing his homework in the spirit. And so he gave birth to another Ishmael. Are you you tracking with me? Spiritual battles require spiritual weapons, not physical ones. Now, it's not to say eventually God will not lead you to do physical things because even the intercessors need to put legs to their prayers. There's a time for that. But many people just focus on Doing in the natural without first accomplishing breakthroughs in the spirit. That's why when we started the meeting, we started praying. I looked at my wife. I said, the atmosphere doesn't feel right even as we're worshiping. Some, it's just hard in here. We're just going to keep, we're going to plow. We, we're going to plow through. Some people don't even care. They don't even notice. They're like, you know what? It's, we're just going to sing a few songs and get to the word. See, when you become a person that starts to grow in prayer, you start to be aware of atmosphere, spiritual things going on that you're blind to. You start to be activated to it. And you realize if you're going to be 
if you're going to be effective in the physical, you have to first be effective in the spiritual. Moses took on the burden. Well, actually, Moses had not taken on the burden in terms of God's burden, the way God was going to release that. Because later on, we see that Moses became one of the greatest intercessors. But he didn't start there. He started as an activist. He wanted to do it himself in his flesh. And then because he did it in his flesh, he actually prolonged the process. What was meant to take 10 years, guess what happens? 40 years was added to it. And those 40 years was Moses in the wilderness. You know what God was doing? God was dealing with his flesh. And we know God dealt with his flesh so well that when he reached 80 and God says, now I want to send you to deliver them, Moses says, not me, God. If God said that to Moses when he was 40, do you know what he would have said? Yes, God, I'm ready. He was full of himself. He was ready, confident, to the point where he killed the Egyptian. And God had to empty him of himself. In fact, because he had the mind of Egypt, God had to get Egypt out of him. God had to deal with Moses. When you sign up to be an intercessor, you sign up to the dealings of God. And if you try to find shortcuts to become a, if you try to find shortcuts to do what God wants to do, and you just want to be an activist and do it in the flesh, you actually prolong the process. So the good thing is to submit to God's dealings. Because when God truly deals with you, he starts to deal with things that you don't even know are in your heart. And you know he's truly dealt with you because you know, he can come back to you and give you the thing that you're desiring so badly in one season and like, oh Lord, just forget it. Some of you, you're so desiring to get in a relationship right now. It's not that it's bad, but there's sometimes, this be my, before I got married, I was so desiring to get into a relationship. I remember going to the ramp and the Lord told me to lay it down. And after some years of laying it down, maybe a couple of years, I actually looked to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm actually happy to be single now. And that's when he said, it's time to get married. <laughs> <laughs> do you see what I'm trying to say like the dealings of the Lord kills something in you yeah. and when he kills it it's like a grain of wheat uh, John 12 24 unless a grain of wheat falls and dies it abides in itself so the death process is quite key for you to grow to the place where God can entrust you with what he wants to entrust you with so it was 390 years and Moses is being stirred but he tries to accomplish this in the flesh. And go, so he's in exile. And so look at what happens as well to the children of Israel. So let's go to Exodus 2, further down, 23. Verse 23. It says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel groaned. Everyone say groaned. Do you know what that is? Let's read that again. It happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel, they, do you know what that is? Romans 8. In, that's prayer. The children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And look at what it says. And they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard, listen to what it says. It didn't, verse 24 in New King James. It didn't say God heard their prayers. Look at what it says. God heard their groanings. See, you can have prayer without burden. God is looking for a burden. The children of Israel, see, they, 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 they were 300, 350 years. They were in captivity, but the intensity of the captivity did not stir up this groaning. So by the time their deliverer was in captivity for 430 years, they had gone past the point where they were supposed to be delivered. And the new king was oppressing them so much. Actually, that oppression was a gift. Because that oppression was stirring up the groanings, which is what God needed to hear. God was not just going to hear their cry. They cried out to God, but their cry came from their groaning. Their hearts were burdened. 
They could, they could feel the captivity. It was stronger than it ever been before. And they had no one else to go to. And they had to groan and cry out to God. They could feel that burning. Pray, again, prayers that don't move you will not move anything. God heard them, not because of their theology. God heard them, not because of how nice they sounded and how amazing their preachers were. God heard them because he could feel their groanings. There are times in prayers where you may not have words to speak. In fact, in prayer, it's better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. Just speaking words, speaking words, speaking words, but there is no burden. It's just empty. When you meet people that carry burdens, when they pray, you, f- you feel something. Because they're praying from a position. They're praying from a place. And sometimes when they pray, you can enter into that same burden too. The children of Israel were groaning. This is 430 years. Do you know what's so crazy about this? We don't know anything that Moses is doing. As far as we know, Moses is still in exile, minding his own business. But the way this is written, this account is written, you can see that the groaning of the people was connected to the encounter of Moses. So Moses himself was not even a prayer warrior at this point yet. But he was being prepared for an encounter. And what sparked that encounter was not so much Moses' prayer, it was the people's intercession. You know what that means? Our intercessions can release encounters to people who are called to bring deliverance that don't even know it yet. Our intercession can stir people. See, the the, the children of Israel had no idea that their intercession meant God was stirring up Moses. They just groaned and had no idea where that groaning ended up and what the end result was. There are times when you pray, you don't have to have all the answers of what's happened on the end of that prayer. In fact, I've shared this story many times. I was on the bus once, and the people at the back of the bus were swearing, young people, they were, you know, on double-decker bus. I was all the way in the front, and they were all the way in the back, probably about 15 or so, a group of them. You know, they were just talking all kinds of junk. And I just felt the Lord say, pray for them. So I started praying in tongues. You won't believe this. The moment I started to pray, the moment I started to pray, their conversation changed, and they're talking about God. So I actually stopped praying because I was so shocked. (laughs) Considering what they were talking about before that, the two didn't add up at all. And I felt the Lord was saying to me, James, I am giving you a pictorial experience, a a real-life experience of what happens when you receive instructions from me and you pray it. I put thoughts in people's minds. James, you just happened to be on the bus to see the result of that prayer. How about the many prayers you're praying and you have no ideas? The thoughts God has placed in people's minds. But you think nothing is happening. You don't know the dream they had. You don't know, you don't know the person they met at work that knows Jesus. Because you prayed, that person opened their mouth and shared Christ with them. And you have no idea about it, but you think nothing is happening. The children of Israel did not know that their groanings was God's preparation for their deliverer. So, you see, their groanings brought Moses' Moses's encounter. And their groanings only happened because the intensity of their oppression increased. So that tells me, if their groanings happened earlier, <laughs> it could have sped up Moses' process too. Do you realize that Prayer has a way of speeding things up. Do you realize that intercession brings about accelerations in the spirit? Do you realize that when we pray, there are things that move in the spirit realm. And our lack of prayer has consequences. And our prayer has consequences too. Peter was in prison, Acts 12. It wasn't because of Peter's prayer the angel came to set him free. I hope you realize that. It was the church's prayer. Because the church was praying constantly, an angel was sent to deliver Peter. So Peter's encounter was a secondary consequence of the church's prayer. So we can run an experiment, a spiritual experiment. We could pick 
Let's pick Micah. I don't know if John Stacy are here or any pastors that are here. We can pick the pastor and tell every member of the church, for the next 40 days, we're going to pray for 30 minutes for the pastor. If everyone in the whole church, let's say there's 200, decide for the next 40 days, every day, they would give up 30 minutes to pray for the pastor. I guarantee you that pastor is going to have some encounters. That pastor is going to have some experience. Things are going to, sometimes I'm, 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 I'm about to preach or, you know, we have an intercessor group, you know, people that pray for us and pray storm and things like that. And sometimes when I'm out, I'm saying, oh yeah, would you pray? This is going on. Sometimes I can feel the prayers because the, the level of ease I am experiencing in the word, the level of ease I'm experiencing, I know it's not because of me. I know it's because of the intercessors. Who are praying and they don't always know the effect of their prayer. That's the thing. You're praying, you're, you don't always see the effect. So the children of Israel could have sped up the process if they had the burden as they had in the 430th year. If they had that burden a lot earlier, they could have stirred up. But you know why it wasn't stirred up? They were still comfortable. Do you understand how comfort kills us? The comfort caused them not to groan. Listen, we are in a crisis right now. You've probably seen the interest rates have gone up. You've probably seen all the craziness going on around us, the news. My wife was shopping the other day, this gone Sunday. She came in the car and said, James, you won't believe it. I'm in the shop. I'm buying stuff and I can hear people. One after the other going, oh my goodness, that's going to buy another two pounds. I can't believe that's going to buy another three pounds. Oh my. So people, people are getting so upset. See, the temperature is rising in the culture because there is a discomfort. And I've often wondered whether the revival we're seeking is going to come in these kind of circumstances. But not just as it is, but on steroids. As, in other words, it's going to get worse. Because it seems like nothing shifts the people of God to intercession and prayer until they begin to feel discomforts. Until they begin to feel like things aren't going. And so all of a sudden, the circumstances is stirring up the intercessor that you are. Well, why do you need to wait for the circumstances before you realize you're that intercessor already? You are that right now. Stir it up. Someone say, stir it up. So, I wrap up. Moses has an encounter, burning bush. The Lord says to him, I am that I am, and all these crazy encounters, you know. The Lord tells Moses, listen, are you with me? Yes. We're wrapping up. The Lord tells Moses, one of the signs was, Moses was, called to, was told to put his rod, which was, I think, Aaron's rod, to put it, actually, I think it was his rod. Anyway, one of the two. One of the, he was told to put the rod on the floor, and you know what happened? The rod became a snake. You all know the story, right? Now, I hate snakes. I hate snakes. And I hate snakes. Just going to make that announcement. I don't know why God created them. I absolutely despise snakes. Now, I don't know much about snakes, but it says when Moses saw the snake, he fled. Which is probably what I would have done. And then God said to him to pick it up. Now, I don't know much about snakes, but what I understand is you don't pick snakes up by their tail. Okay? God specifically told Moses to pick up the snake by its tail. You see, there is a prophetic word in that. Now, when you look at the throne of Moses and you look at Pharaoh, you see that thing Pharaoh puts on his head? Do you know it's, it's the re resemblance of a cobra? Do you know that the Egyptians really valued snakes? And they almost, I believe they even worshipped it and saw some kind of divinity to it. So Pharaoh's throne took the embodiment of a serpent. Are you tracking with me? So God says to him, put the rod on the floor. He puts the rod on the floor, it becomes a snake. And then God says to him, pick it up by the tail. Meaning, I am giving you authority over this snake. He got authority over the serpent spirit 
in the wilderness. That was the spirit that was binding the people. Pharaoh's throne was on that, was, was run on that serpent spirit. So God was saying to Moses, before I send you to bring deliverance to the people, I am going to deliver you from what's binding them, give you authority over what's binding them, and then I'm going to send you to bring them out as an intercessor. Until we have truly met God, we don't have the authority to shift a nation. Encounters cannot be replaced by nice services. Encounters cannot be replaced by nice preaching. That is why one of the things that we need to be crying out for is, Lord, I want to encounter you in a deeper way such that I can begin to feel what you feel. Because in those encounters, God allows you to be able to step into places of authority. So your intercession now starts to have legs to it. And God sends you into territories and you can do things in those territories. You can speak in those places. And you see, this is one of the dangers. This is one of the problems that we have in the church because people don't see themselves as intercessors. So they see just the preacher or the crazy prayer guy over there or the uh, old lady at the back of the church. And because they don't see themselves as intercessors, they don't realize when you're going into your workplace, if you're an intercessor, you cannot come under the spirit that's ruling in that place. But if you don't see yourself as an intercessor, you're going to be a victim in that environment. So when you're in your time at home, actually, the encounters you're supposed to have with God, like Moses, where he gives you authority over the thing that is binding, the place he has sent you as an intercessor. The place he's sending you may not be the place he's sending me. Some people think to serve God, they have to preach. You don't have to preach on a platform to serve God. You could be a full-time nurse right there in that hospital. God called you as an intercessor to shift the atmosphere. But because you're not having encounters at home and you're not letting God deal with you in the secret place, you step into that workplace and you become a victim of the atmosphere. You can't shift it because you did not have authority over it when you weren't there. You did not have authority over it when it was time to really press into God. Something, nothing shifted in you. And if God doesn't do that work in you until you encounter God you don't have the authority to shift things over nations. And you see that with Elijah. Elijah had encountered God in a deep way. That was why his words carried weight. So I wrap up with this. Just like Moses was a prophet who started out feeling stirred of God, but lacked that intercessory calling, or, well, no, no, not calling, lacked that intercessory burden, God placed it on the people of Israel. Moses has an encounter. He's delivered. He goes to bring them out. And see, you see how God works with Moses? He became one of the greatest intercessors. Do you know how Moses interceded? This is probably the highest level of intercession. By the way, the highest picture of intercession in Scripture is Jesus' death on the cross. That's ultimate intercession. He took everything, burden. Did you hear that? He took everything on him and he died in our place. Do you know that's exactly what Moses said? After Moses had been through the dealings of God, after Moses has had the prophetic gifts activated in him, we could tell this man was also an intercessor. Because he then said to the Lord, Lord, destroy me instead of them. See, I've heard some people pray. They're praying for the nation. Oh, Lord, deliver them. All those drug addicts over there. You know, all those people who are in the section of the Lord, you know, convict them of their sin. And you can feel from the prayer there is no burden that's feeling what those people are feeling. Wow. Are you with me? Moses said, Lord, they have sinned. They're a stiff-necked people. Instead of destroying them, destroy me. <laughs> How many of you would do that? So do you see that when... We talk about Moses starting in a place where he hadn't picked up the burden. As he walks with God in intimacy, he finally, he, he, it's like 
he, he became the burden. He carried the people. It was, he was one with them. And he could feel what they felt. He could bring that to God. He got frustrated with them too. He could feel what, see, that's what an intercessor is. You stand in the gap. He could feel what God felt. He could feel what the people felt. He could bring the people's burdens to God. But he could also bring the heart of God to the people. As an intercessor, when you begin to pray, one of the things that opens up is the prophetic. There is no way you can pray effectively without really receiving downloads of wisdom and insight from heaven. Can I get the band to come up? Because we're going to pray. Some of you, you've been in captivity for too long. Are you hearing me? For some of you, what should have taken 20 years is now taking 30 years, is now taking 40 years. Partly because you have not been submitting yourself to God's dealings. You've been trying to find the shortcut. You've been trying to, you've been trying to get the man of God or the woman of God to lay hands on you and pray you out of your process. But God has allowed the process, Hannah. God allowed the process, Hannah. Hannah was called to have children, but God allowed her to be barren. Because that was the process needed to birth Samuel. God is wanting us to go through that process. God is wanting us to carry his burdens of intercession. That we become those people that can birth in the earth the desire of God. And we don't have to wait for crisis to stir it. We're saying, Lord, stir it in us right now. Right now. Right now. Lord, we repent for complaining about situations where it was actually a growth opportunity. Lord, we repent for allowing circumstances to be all that we have just weigh us down but we're not able to see what you're doing and submit to you father we repent for just receiving prophetic words that are lacking the intercessory burdens to bring them into fruition father we're sorry for where we've connected ourselves to things, people, movements that just make it easy. Lord, you want to raise us up the hard way, the intercession. You want to raise us up the way of, of the cross, the way of the dealings of the flesh. You want to raise up in a way that we come out on the other side and we're different people. So Father, we're sorry for trying to shortcut the process. Some of you just need to say, Lord, I know it's a painful process, but I embrace your dealings. The things you're wanting me to go through, I'm going to go through and come out on the other side. A different person, a victorious person, an effective prayer warrior, an effective intercessor. Do you understand with me? We're going to pray. Just like God worked in Moses. The cost of living in crisis. We just had coronavirus. We just had COVID. You know, after COVID, then it's like the next thing happens. You know, I don't know what it was like. You know, it's like one thing leads to the next. Now it's an economic crisis. Who knows what's going to happen, you know, some months down the line. It's like one big event to the next. Here in the UK, we've had a massive shakings in our government. And it seems to me like the shakings have not finished. In fact, I feel like there is more shakings to come. And we're going to say, Lord, we don't have to wait for the pressure before we take on the burden. Right now, Father, we want to begin to receive your burdens. We want to begin to receive your groanings. We want to begin to receive your desires for the land. We want to begin to receive your burden for the nation. We don't want to count ourselves out. We're not going to learn intercession by just reading a book. We want to feel your burdens right now. We don't want to be selfish people anymore. And we're saying, Father, give us your burden for the lost. Give us your burden for revival. Give us your burden for the nation. We want to know the groanings of heaven. We want to submit ourselves to the, to the dealings of heaven in this generation. 
No more. No more are we going to just look for the shortcut, the easy way out. Mark us today, Father. We don't want to be wimps. We want to be warriors of intercession. So, Father, we break off discouragement. We break off doubt, cynicism, and unbelief. We say, Father, let the prayer engines, let the intercessory engines within us be stirred again. Stir up the intercessory burdens, Lord. We step out of selfish ambitions. We step out of selfish desires. And we say, Father, we want to be the end time army. The end time army that the nation needs. The end time army that our communities need, Lord. Mark us with a spirit of grace and supplication. It starts right here. Come on, lift your voice to heaven. Say, Father, make me an intercessor like Moses was made into. Make me an intercessor. I want to grow in the spirit. Retreat, no surrender. I let go of all the oppression and the discouragement. I let go of offense. I let go of lies of the enemy. I receive your burdens, Jesus. We want to groan in the spirit. We want to feel the burdens of heaven. We don't just want to go through our prayer list. We want to feel what he feels for the nation. We want to feel what he feels for the lost. We want to feel what he feels for the broken. We want to feel his passions. We want to enter into the grace of supplication. If you want to Say yes to the Lord in a fresh way this evening. How about you just come forward right now and let's make this altar a place of saying, Lord, we want to enter into your burdens. Mark 
us tonight with burdens, Lord. We want to be intercessors that carry your burdens like Moses. We want to carry your burdens like Elijah. We want to carry your burdens like Jeremiah. We want to carry your burdens like Daniel. We want to carry your burdens for the nation, Lord. Oh, come on, just lift your heart to the Lord right now. Say, Father, release your burdens over me. I want to really, I want to receive your groanings. into intercession right if the prophetic word was an invitation into intercession so right now because this is an equipping time I want you to remember and dust off a prophetic word that someone has spoken over your life might be your church might be your family or it might just be for yourself but I want you right now to use that prophetic word and start to speak it back to God this is an equipping thing right now so I want you to remember right now, listen to the Holy Spirit, what was a prophetic word spoken over you that you forgot about or you've not done anything with. And I want you right now to spend a couple of minutes just praying in the Spirit using that prophetic word as your script. All right, let's go.
Jesus, we are declaring that we will not just be receivers of prophecy. Or we will not just be prophetic voices that speak. But we will be intercessors that are able to birth the prophetic words you're even releasing through us. That the prophetic and the intercessory would match up in the Spirit, Lord. So Father, we say you would mark us with that. Just like it was said to Timothy to wage war with the prophetic word. We will wage war with the prophetic words, Lord. We will carry your burdens tonight. We will be marked by your heart afresh. Just bring it down. You know, even as we're praying, keep praying, don't stop. As we're praying, I just want you to be aware that even in moments like this, the Lord is reigniting intercessory kind of unique callings that have been lying dormant. Yes. There's some people here where there's a specific calling God has placed on you to intercede over marriages in a specific way. And it's like, you don't know why, but when you see certain people, you see certain things, you begin to hear from the Lord, you begin to get a sense of things going on. God is not asking you to gossip about it or to talk about it. And He's inviting you to begin to carry His burdens for that person in a specific way. For some other people in this room, it might be that you're feeling drawn to unusual times to pray unusual hours to seek the Lord and you know it's not normal it might be strange hours of the morning or strange hours of the night and you can feel the Lord is drawing you and sometimes even your flesh will try to resist but as you give in to the drawing of the Lord the grace of the Lord comes and you find yourself moving in fresh burdens from the Lord that he wants to release at specific times of the night the other intercessors in this room that God has called you to pray in specific areas, sometimes over people. There's some people that God gives a unique assignment to pray over certain leaders. It could be leaders in the body of Christ, or it could be leaders who are in government. I know some intercessors carry a, a unique burden for government. And it's just, you wonder why everyone else is not feeling the same thing. It's because God is, is calling you to carry that burden. The more you give into it, the more it's going to grow. So Father, we say, whatever the burden you want to release, we want it to receive it. Yes, Lord. Just lift your hands with me and say, Father, whatever the burden you're wanting to release, we are willing to receive it. We are willing to receive your burdens for the government, your burdens for the youth, your, your burden for the nation. Your burden for the for, for the prime minister. Your burden. Your burden for pastors. Your burden for young leaders. Your burden for children. Your burden for musicians. Your burden for worship leaders. We are willing to receive your burden, Lord. Oh, let it propel us into new depths of intercession. Let your burden propel us into new depths of intercession. Let your burden propel us. Keep praying, don't stop. We're going to go on like this for a few more moments. This is a prayer training conference. If you've just tuned in and you're watching, this is night one. And we've got three more sessions on Saturday. If you're watching us on YouTube, we're broadcasting just this session. I want to encourage you to go on to prayerstorm.org, our website. We're going to be doing some more teaching all day tomorrow. We've got three more sessions of teaching and equipping and prayer and intercession. I want to encourage you to join us for that. Those of you in the room, I want to encourage you to just keep pressing in some more. Pressing in to the Lord. That His burdens will begin to increase. Hallelujah. 
the discouragement goes the discouragement goes right now in the name of Jesus the discouragement leaves in the name of Jesus faith arise faith arise hearts be stirred faith arise for what the Lord is doing at this time